Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Madness to Miracles radio show brought to you by Odyssey House. This is a show aired that airs weekly right here on WFOV 92.1 LPM FM Flint, Our Voices Radio. This is a show about addiction and recovery with the focus being primarily on the recovery process. I'm your host, Anisha Freeman. I'm also known as the locksmith because I make keys people who are locked up in their minds. I'm also a therapist. I work at the Flint and Saginaw location of Odyssey House, and I'm also the clinical director at Saginaw Odyssey House. So I would like to tell you a little bit about our organization, Our, in case you don't know. Um, Odyssey House specializes in residential and outpatient treatments for people who suffer with substance use disorder and mental health issues. So we work with people who are co-occurring, but our primary focus is working with people who struggle with substance use disorders. We have inpatient and outpatient treatment services in Flint. We have recovery houses in Flint, Saginaw, and Port Huron. We also have inpatient treatment in Saginaw. Now, our Saginaw location is primarily for women, women we take women, single women, expecting mothers. We take women with children, and we do that also at our Flint location. We can take in an entire family at our Flint location. So if you know anyone who is struggling, who needs some help, give us a call. We can be reached during normal business hours at 810 238 and we also have a 24-hour crisis line. That number is 810-238-0483. So uh, our show, Madness to Miracles, is actually named after an event created by Odyssey House, um, and it's held every September in celebration of National Recovery Month is National Recovery Month. And last year, 2018, our event was held on September the 12th in Saginaw. We had, I believe, like 600, 700 people. I'm not exactly sure of the count. I know in 2017, we had almost 900 people at our event, Madness to Miracles. And we heard stories about recovery, uh, we gave out awards to people, recognizing their accomplishments in the recovery field, people in their own lives, and people who actually help others. We had entertainment. We had an awesome keynote speaker. We had food and fun and fellowship. So stay tuned. We will be bringing you more information about our Madness to Miracles event that will be held this September. Um, and we're not, I'm not exactly sure of the details yet, so stay tuned. So every week on the Madness to Miracles show, I will either have a guest speaker who will share um, some of their recovery journey with us. They'll tell us their story. Um, and some weeks I'll just focus on a topic, a recovery-related topic. This week, I have a topic. So I'm going to talk about the comfort zone. I'm going to talk about the comfort zone as it relates to being comfortable in dysfunctional environments. So I'm going to talk about the comfort zone of active addiction and how some people can even get stuck in their comfort zone in recovery, and it keeps them from pro progressing to the next level. So this um, title actually came from my, one of my books. Uh, when I have a book entitled What's Really Going On? And it features 31 articles from uh, when I used to write for the Grand Rapids Times when I lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I wrote this particular, on this particular subject after I heard one of my instructors at the gym uh, constantly say, come out of your comfort zone. So I used to take a spin class pretty regularly, and one of our instructors, we would be already be working hard. We would be working really hard in, in um, the class. It's a tough class, 
but he would challenge us. He says, I know you're working, but you're in your comfort zone. So I'm getting ready to take you out of your comfort zone. So I either want you to speed up or I want you to put more resistance, which is more weight on the bike so that you will have to push harder. He said, don't cheat yourself. He says, if you stay in your comfort zone, you are cheating yourself. And he would say that over and over and over again. And so it kind of stuck with me. And so I have found in my own personal life that all as I advance, uh, uh, as I came into recovery, as I have accomplished goals, every new step I took necessitated that I come out of my comfort zone. So I want to talk about that today. First, I want to talk about the comfort zone of active addiction. So I, um, like I said earlier, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I use drugs and alcohol from the age of 16. Well, I started before six, age 16, but it got really bad around age 16, and I entered the recovery process at age 36. So I used drugs and alcohol heavily for 20 years. And so I got comfortable uh, with the dysfunction associated with that lifestyle. Now, when I first started uh, 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 freebasing, which is took my addiction to a whole nother level, I was living in Chicago. I was working in corporate America. I used to work for Firestone Corporate Headquarters. And so like, I was not living on the streets. I had a career, you know, I had an apartment, but the disease of addiction took me down, all the way down. I'm from Detroit, born and raised, so I wound up going back to Detroit, and I got introduced to the crack cocaine subculture. So I started living in crack houses, living on the street, uh, being in flea bag motels, um, hanging out in dope houses. I got comfortable with that lifestyle. So it is easy to become comfortable, comfortable in dysfunction. I have that personal experience. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm also a therapist. So I work with a lot of people and I have seen, you know, how they have become comfortable with the dysfunction associated with active addiction. So on August the 7th of the year 2000, when I walked away from the crack motel, when I made a decision, I don't want to live like this anymore, I actually became very uncomfortable. And so many who are not familiar with addiction may say, well, why were you uncomfortable? You were leaving the streets and the dangers and and leaving people like Tricky Ricky and Shady Grady and Silk slime and canine, wouldn't you be excited that you were leaving there? Well, no, it was a change for me. And people often are discomfortable with change. Plus, in active addiction, uh, the drugs and alcohol were had, became, had become my number one coping tool. I didn't even know what I was coping from. I later found out through therapy and through treatment that I was self-medicating a lot of untreated trauma and a lot of other issues and, and undiagnosed, untreated mental health uh, disorder, which was actually depression. And so I had been self-medicating. And so when I stopped self-medicating, I was very uncomfortable. But my, my freedom was in the discomfort. Now, I heard one of my spiritual mentors say something very profound, and I think it was Pastor Joel Brooks Jr. I'm not sure. I have so many people I listen to, and they mentor me through their books and tapes, see DVDs and YouTube videos. Uh, so I think it was Pastor Joel Brooks Jr. I, I heard him say, there's a difference between a comfort zone and a safety zone. So when I left the streets, when I left the drug subcultures, I was very uncomfortable, but I was entering into a safety zone. Okay, so that applies on a lot of different levels, that our comfort zones are not synonymous with our safety zones. Sometimes they're totally different. I was comfortable living in a, a very different, dangerous environment. I was comfortable in that environment. I had adapted to it. I'm talking about I had perfected the tuck and roll, like meaning that I had to jump out of moving cars from time to time due to my lifestyle on the street supported myself in active addiction. Uh, you should not be comfortable jumping out of moving cars unless you are a Hollywood stunt person. I was not a Hollywood stunt person. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so even though I, when I left uh, and I went back to treatment one more time um, after I left the, the crack motel and, and um, I moved into a recovery house and I stayed there two years, I was actually very, very uncomfortable that first year. Everything was uncomfortable for me. It was uncomfortable the first time I went grocery shopping. I was overwhelmed. I hadn't been grocery shopping in so many years. I had lost count. I didn't grocery shop. I bought drugs. So I was overwhelmed by the store, the size of the store trying to find everything and the prices I'm like oh my goodness because I hadn't shopped in a long time I was living off out of uh, a fast food restaurants and corner store junk food so it was overwhelming for me uh, it was overwhelming for me learning how to manage my emotions and process feelings I had been stuffing them and 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 medicating them for for years for for a couple decades so I was uncomfortable but I was I was in a safety zone. I was getting better. I was healing. So early in um, the recovery process, as I started adjusting to life on life terms without the use of drugs and alcohol, I entered into another comfort zone. So I got comfortable not using. I got comfortable living in the recovery house. I got comfortable going to my 12-step meetings. I got comfortable uh, with my support network of people. But that comfort zone, it, it it if I had stayed there, like my gym instructor told instructor told me, I would have been cheating myself if I had stayed at that level. It was appropriate the first year or two that I had uh, the 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 recovery house supporting me, and I had the people who had perfected staying out of the dope house who were mentoring me. But there was some other things that I wanted. There was another level. So once again, in order to progress in the recovery process, I had to be willing to be uncomfortable again as I didn't I didn't want to cheat myself out of moving and advancing to the next level so there came a point in time after two years that I had to move out of the recovery house and it was very uncomfortable I was very nervous I had become very comfortable in my little room at the top of the stairs at the recovery house in Grand Rapids Michigan and that place it did so much I got so much there I uh the the director of the recovery house, she helped me in so many ways, but it was time for me to cut the apron, apron strings from her, and I was very uncomfortable. I remember when I went and signed the lease for my own apartment, um, I was getting ready to go to court to fight to get custody back of one of my children. I had to have an apartment. I had to have some place to live. I had to be able to show the judge that I had a place big enough for my daughter and myself to live. And so when I went and signed the lease uh, I had never signed a lease before. I had lived in places, but I had lived in places that didn't require a lease before. So when I was reading the document, they were like, this is what you have to pay every month and you have to pay it for a year. Even if you leave and move out earlier, you still got to pay us this same amount of money every month that whole year. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember sitting there very uncomfortable with the ink pen because I got a job and I was working, you know, but I was still fighting that belief system that said, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to keep that job. You're going to mess up. So I had to become uncomfortable. I had to be willing to become uncomfortable again to move and progress in recovery. So I signed the lease and my life started progressing. Um, I had already got my associate's degree when I was living in a recovery house and that was uncomfortable. I remember when I was about to graduate, I was so happy because I felt like those people were trying to kill me those that year and a half uh, that I did. I did my associate's in a year and a half and, and I'm talking about they were, I was taking five or six classes at a time so I, I really felt like those people were trying to kill me. And I remember towards the end, I was about to graduate and I was talking to some of my friends in the 12-step program and and some of them were like Anisha where are you going for your next two years and I'm looking at them like next two years what what next two for heaven's sake what next two years are you talking about I'm in the home stretch these people are trying to kill me and you're talking about doing another two years I had no idea I was going to keep going and eventually have two master's degrees but every 
advancement in recovery required that I come out of my comfort zone. There was not, because see, a comfort zone um, can become unsafe. And it may not appear that it was unsafe. I was working, going to school, you know, going to my 12-step meetings. I was doing a lot of things, good things in the process, but there was another level. There was other things inside of me. There was things inside of me that needed to come out to be birthed into society. So I had to come out of my comfort zone. The first uh, a year or so when I lived in that recovery house, I was smoke chain smoking cigarettes. I was eating at the all-you-can-eat buffet. I was actually replacing the dope and alcohol with the coping tool of nicotine and food. And so there came a point, and that was appropriate early in recovery for me because I wouldn't have made it if I hadn't had my cigarettes and my all-you-could-eat buffet experiences. But there came a point in time where that comfort zone became unsafe. You know, I started, I was really coughing a lot and 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 I was like well this probably after two years this is probably not the drugs coming out of my system it's probably these cigarettes and so I knew that I didn't want to survive active addiction and then let nicotine kill me in recovery so I had to wean I weaned myself off people use different methods after two years clean it took me to about two and a half, almost three years to completely wing myself off those cigarettes. And I was very, very, very uncomfortable, but I was uncomfortable, but I was moving into a safety zone. And so I winked myself off. Uh, I didn't like uh, being a size 20. Uh, I was in denial that I had got up to a size 20, but when your size 18s don't fit anymore, You wear a size 20. I just refused to go to the store and buy any, so I was wearing stretch pants and and, and, and jogging suits and things. (laughs) And so I made a decision. This size 20 is not working for me anymore. I became uncomfortable. So what I did was I I signed up for an exercise class um, at the college I was attending, they taught me how to work out properly. Um, the first time we started doing cardio, I could only do it for 10 minutes, and it was very uncomfortable. Uh, uh, but being uh, overweight, I was obese, but I don't like using the term. So, so it was. I had become comfortable with my eating habits. I was not comfortable with how I looked and how I felt and not hard and hardly being able to breathe when I walked up the stairs at the college and had to walk to the bus stop. This is before I got my first little car. I was not comfortable with that, but I was comfortable with my um, eating habits. So I had to become uncomfortable to learn how to eat healthy, to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and lean meats. At the time I ate meat, I'm vegan now, but back then I was still eating meat, but I had to switch the type of meats that that I was I was eating and I had to switch the way I cooked them. I had to start frying everything. And it was uncomfortable because during the time when I made those changes, I lived in a recovery house and other people were deep frying things and I would smell it and I had to go down and bake my little chicken and bake my little fish and it was very uncomfortable. But like one of my mentors said, there's a difference between a comfort zone and a safety zone. And so like I really, as I work with people as a therapist, people with substance use disorder, I challenge people now. I challenge people. Okay, you have to make adjustments. Now, early in recovery, you can't work on everything at the same time. Well, maybe you can. It just didn't work for me. Okay? And so I don't want to make assumptions. Maybe some people can work on everything at once, but it didn't work for me. And I've seen other people who've tried and it didn't go too well for them. So I remember one time I was thinking at the recovery house, I had a bright idea. I said I was going to wing myself off the cigarettes. I was going to wing myself off caffeine and I was going to uh, go on a diet. And I was going to do that all at the same time while going to school taking five classes. It didn't turn out that well. 
<laughs> so I had to bag up and say, okay, let me make a list of things I need to work on because all of them are going to make me uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable to make all of these changes, but I couldn't do them all at one time. So I started prioritizing and I started working on them. And um, after a while, I could start working on one. And then after I got a handle on one, I still was doing it, but then I could add the other one. So I could, I started weaning myself off cigarettes and, and I was started to work out and eat better. But first, I started on the cigarettes and then I started focusing on eating right and so I started blending things in and I started saying hey I, I, I became accustomed to being uncomfortable um, during the, my first job, I was working at the Community Leadership Institute at Aquinas College. It used to be at Aquinas College. It, it was, this was in 2001. Was that 2000? No, it was 2000. Yeah, 2002. I started working at the Community Leadership Institute. Um, it was run by George Hartwell. He closed the institute in, I believe, 2006. But at the time, it was housed at Aquinas College. And um, he also was the mayor of Grand Rapids. And he would push me. I was his assistant. And he would push me out of my comfort zone. He would come in and be like, good morning, Anisha. We're going to push Anisha out of her comfort zone today. <laughs> I failed to see the humor. I did not think it was funny. I used to drive to work after I got my little first car. I drove to work like this because I knew he was going to do something that day. He was going to challenge me. He was going to give me an assignment. He was going to give me something to do that was going to push me out of my comfort zone. I didn't understand at the time that he was really helping me. He was helping me become accustomed to challenging myself to go from level to level. And once you push yourself out of your comfort zone, you will adapt to that next level. Just like I adapted to the dysfunction of living in flea bag motels, hanging out in dangerous crack houses. I mean, talking about going to places that I don't believe Dracula or Frankenstein would go. I mean, some of those places look like ha very dangerous haunted houses. They were terrible. And I would be just la 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 la, skipping down the alley to this dangerous looking place with dangerous people. It just didn't look dangerous. It actually was very dangerous. I became accustomed to that. I became comfortable with that. So if I can adapt to dysfunction, I can be uncomfortable as I pursue new goals and new levels, and I will adapt. And then what I've discovered is that once you adapt, you can coast for a minute, but then it's time. That's a signal when you adapt and become comfortable. That's a signal that it's time to push yourself out your comfort zone. Don't cheat yourself, as they told me at the gym. Don't cheat yourself. You're, you're, you're spinning, you're, you're sitting there riding that bike, Anisha, and you don't look like you're suffering. And that's what they were telling him in, in the spin class at the gym. He, you know, we were working. It was a hard, tough class. But he said, you don't look like you're struggling or suffering. So that means you're in your comfort zone. And so some people may be like, Anisha, I don't want to spend all of my life struggling and suffering. That's not what this is about. This is about the, the comfort zone. It's about being willing to come out of what you are comfortable with, endure that uncomfortable adjustment period to go to the next level. Sometimes your comfort zone is the people that you're hanging around. Even in recovery, you may be hanging around with people who have settled for one level of recovery, but you feel that there's more, like there's something missing. You 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 may feel like, well, I really want to do something. You know, I don't I don't really care for my job. I kind of want a career, so I want to go to school. So if you're hanging around people who um, every time you mention school, they be like, oh, that's school too hard. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, that's too much. That's too much stress. That's too much pressure. Then you're going to be stuck. So you may have to be uncomfortable as you kind of like make new acquaintances. It's not saying that you can't have anything to do with those people anymore, but you may need to lessen the amount of time that you spend with people who are, don't have the same goals and aspirations as you. And you need to start gravitating towards people who have been to where you're going. They've been there or they're already there. They're there now and they're, they're working through the process or there's some people who went there and they made it through. Like they graduated so they can mentor you and it may be uncomfortable when you're adjusting to these new people I remember when I changed my entire support system and the the, the support system that I had for the first three years 
they were appropriate for that first three years. They taught me how to stay off the dope house. They had perfected that. But there were some things I wanted that they had not done yet, and they didn't have to have done them. They were okay with the quality of their lives. I wanted something more. So I started hanging out with some people that I met. Um, they were also in recovery, but they were doing the types of things that I was ex aspiring to do. And I was very uncomfortable because their conversations were different. I remember Remember, I'm a very outspoken, outgoing person, but I went to an event that um, some of them were having and they were like uh, talking. I was quiet because the first time I said something, I said something that was uh, uh, from the other world I had came from and everyone stopped they stopped talking and looked at me because I was making a cynical a joke. It was, it was cynical and it was negative, and they didn't do that. They didn't sit around making complaining and uh, being sarcastic and making cynical comments. They were talking about their goals, their dreams, their aspirations, the process they were in, the strategies they had learned, the strategies they had they were perfecting. They were talking about businesses and all types of the careers. They were talking about their significant others too, but they weren't talking about a dis dysfunctional relationship. They were talking about the kind, wonderful things that their significant other uh, um, was doing for them and with them. And so I was quiet because I was amazed. I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. Uh, but I adapted. I adapted. I was uncomfortable, but I was in a safety zone. And so remember, if you're in your comfort zone and you're staying there, you might be cheating yourself. And like one of my mentors said, there's a difference between a comfort zone and a safety zone. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining me today on the Madness to Miracles radio show. This is Anisha Freeman, your host, giving you the keys you need for a wonderful life. I'll see you next week.